gearbeitet? Was? Okay, so, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Zohar is the major text of Kabbalah. Was? It is, the Zohar is the major text of Kabbalah, and it's one of the most central, authoritative, sacred, and influential texts in Jewish culture. Okay, although you, maybe you would like to hear about the book itself, I will say a few words about it. Today I will speak more on the way it was created and received, on its impact on Jewish culture. So you'll know what to expect. What I will be speaking about today is about the creation and formation of the, uh, of the Zohar, on its authority, on its perception as sacred, and on the impact of the Zohar in matters of doctrine and practice. I will also discuss the criticism and objection to the Zohar. Although the Zohar gained a very central place in Jewish culture, there were also some Jewish circles that criticized and rejected the Zohar. And finally, I will speak about the reception uh, of, the, of the Zohar in modern and contemporary period and its integration into contemporary culture. And I believe the concert that we'll hear will be a very good example of such an integration. Okay, so before I discuss the reception of the Zohar, a few words about what the Zohar is. The Zohar is a collection of texts. The scope of the Zohar as it is received today was defined by the first printers of the Zohar in the 16th century in Italy. You can see here uh, uh, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, printed editions of the Zohar. All later editions of the Zohar are based on this edition, the first edition of the Zohar printed in Mantov. The printed editions are uh, uh, based on manuscript of the Zohar. There are hundreds of them. I won't speak today much about them, uh, uh, but the, the, the earliest uh, um, a, a manuscript of the Zohar is from around 1300. The Zohar includes different units, and already on the first printers indicated that it's not one text, but different units, different texts. The text here says, that's from the, the title page of the Zohar, uh, uh, it says, uh, the Zohar on the Torah, by the saintly sage Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, with Sitrei Torah and Midrash Ne'elam and Tosefta, all the words I said in Hebrew or Aramaic, are different units that are printed as the Zohar, are parts of the Zohar. Here you can see a, a page from the, pages from the Zohar, even if you don't read Aramaic, you can see here that the, this is a section, this is a unit, this is a different unit. Okay, so the, pages is, the, the page of the Zohar is divided to the different units in the Zohar. Okay, now, now there are many differences, I won't get into it, but there are also a few resemblances between the different units of the Zohar, and that will give you, I'll say a few words, that you'll have some impression of what the Zohar is about. Most of the Zohar, of the Zoharic text, are, what they offer is a Kabbalistic Midrash commentary on the Torah. Now, I don't know if you know what Midrash is. Midrash is the special method of commentaries on the Torah that was de developed by the Talmudic rabbis. Yeah, it's a very free kind of commentary. Now the Zohar is a Kabbalistic Midrash. So what is Kabbalah? Okay, so what is, what is Kabbalah? In one minute I'll give you, standing on one leg, I'll tell you what Kabbalah is. Okay, so it would be really just the, the most, I think, central ideas of Kabbalah, just to give you a taste. A central idea of Kabbalah is the divine God is comprised from 10 different attributes that are called the sefirot. The sefirot are attributes of God, like his wisdom, his kindness, his anger, but also the limbs, the, the parts of the body of the divine system, hand, head, etc. Okay, so that's one characteristic of, uh, of, the, of uh, Kabbalah. The second one that I will discuss today is the idea that human beings have an influence, positive or negative, on the divine system. If human beings sin, they, they harm the harmony between the different sefirot. If they do God's will, 
they, they, they improve the harmony in the divine. Okay, so that's one characteristic, Zohar Midrashic, a Kabbalistic Midrash. That means it finds in the, the, the secrets of the Kabbalah, the ideas of the Kabbalah, it finds them, the Sefirot and the idea of human influence on them, the people who wrote the Zohar, find them, interpret them in the verses of the Torah. Okay, two other uh, characteristics of the Zohar before I start speaking about its reception. Most of the Zoharic texts are written in Aramaic, and the, the, the personalities that are described in the Zohar, and the most important person who is described and explains the verses of the Torah is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, a third century Talmudic scholar, a Tana. Now I'll move to the question of the authorship of the Zohar. Who wrote the Zoharic text? According to the tradition, this is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai himself. Here you see an authentic picture of him. By the way, Rabbi Shimon Bar the Zohar itself never, this never says that it was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Actually, the death of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is described in the Zohar. But that's true also about Moses, and we all know that Moses wrote the Torah. So according to tradition still held today, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the author of the Zohar. But since the first appearance of the Zohar, the first mention of the Zohar, and this is in the late 13th century, some rabbis, some people doubted that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote the Zohar, and, and, and thought that it was a later text. Some rabbis and modern scholars believed that the text was written by Rabbi Moshe de Leon, who lived in the, the 13th century, late 13th century, in Spain. M most scholars today believe that indeed Rabbi Moshe de Leon was the author of most of the Zoharic text, although probably some of the units in the Zohar were written by other scholars at the same period. Okay, so as I said, the first the Zohar was dispersed in manuscripts and then in print. Uh, uh, it was printed, as I said, in the late uh, second half of the 16th uh, century. Since its appearance, but especially after the print of the Zohar, some Kabbalists regarded it as an authoritative text, a text of authority in matters of Kabbalah and Kabbalistic doctrines. And I want to read you a text that was written in the early 16th century, that you have an impression what, when I speak, it was perceived as authoritative text. What do I mean? This is a Kabbalist, Yehuda Kayat, writing in the early 16th century. And he says thus, Blessed and privileged are we to be awarded the Zohar, which our ancestors, whose little finger was thicker than our loins, were not awarded. And if one says that the wisdom contains matters alien to reason, okay, I say, okay, I, I want to emphasize, even if it looks very weird to you, if it's against your reason, and I continue to read, it is as the holy, godlike Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, not every ba brain is fit for it, only the holy and wise one can, etc., understand it, etc. And we must truly, and wholeheartedly accept their words and set them as a crown upon our heads and say, even if my heart turns right or left, I will follow the beliefs of the godlike holy light, the pride of the Tanaim and the crown of the sages, superior to a prophet, Shimon Bar Yochai and his companions. Okay, so I think you, you can see how strong this statement about the authority of the Zohar is. Okay, this is a matter of beliefs, matter of doctrines, but, it, but you probably know that in Jewish uh, uh, culture, practice is more important than beliefs. Since the 16th century, uh, uh, Jewish rabbis state that also in matters of halakha, of religious law, the Zohar should be followed. Okay, this is a text by Yosef Karo. You, maybe you heard about him, the most important uh, uh, Jewish uh, 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 expert on legal law. And he says here, I won't read the text, but what he says, 
If the Zohar does not contradict the Talmud, you should follow him. Even if all the other rabbis before said something else, you should follow what the Zohar says in matters of halakha, of religious practice. So once these uh, uh, statements about the Zohar as an authority text in the 16th century by very important rabbis was accepted, people started following and integrating the Zohar into Jewish life. For instance, the Zohar says that on Saturday service, when you open the, the Ark of the Torah to get out the Torah to read in it, there, are, there is a formula that you have to say in Aramaic called Brich Shmei. And today in every synagogue, uh, you will hear on the Saturday service, apart from some reform services, you will hear the Brich Shmei. Hopefully we will hear it also. And you'll get maybe an impression of the of how, how the Zohar also sounds. Okay, so this, this is one example. Maybe we'll hear some, some uh, vibrations of that uh, text also later in the concert. I hope so. Another custom which is very popular, I bet you that Oshkolot also does it, is Tikkun Leil Shavuot. On the eve of the holiday of Shavuot, the, the, the Zohar uh, um, describes an event of uh, staying awake all night and uh, studying Torah. And it's called Tikkun. Okay, and as you know now Kabbalah, because I explained to you what Kabbalah is in two minutes, so Tikkun is the repair of the divine system. By studying the Torah and the night of Shavuot, you help the divine system to be more harmonious, in a more harmonious state. And this is a very popular uh, uh, um, custom to do, uh, also in today in contemporary Israel, also not on non-Orthodox people do it, and I think very, very few people know that it's actually based on what was described for the first time in the Zohar. Now, as an authoritative text, it's not just a matter of practices, but also on the development of Kabbalah. All later Kabbalah, the most important developments in Kabbalah are actually based on commentaries on the Zohar. Since the 16th century until today, many commentaries of the Zohar were written, are still written. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, there are many, and of course I won't mention, uh, just one of them I will mention. This is the interpretation of Ha'ari, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria to the Zohar. Maybe you heard about him. He's considered maybe the most important Kabbalist after Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and actually his system of Kabbalah is developed on his commentaries on the Zohar. Now, the Zohar was not considered only as an authoritative text, a text that you have to believe what it says, that it contains truth, and you have to follow what it describes, what it says, tells you to do, but also as a sacred and powerful text. And I'll just read you a short text, again by the same rabbi that I read before from the 16th century. And through the merit of those who learn and study it, the Messiah will come, for the land shall be filled with knowledge of the Lord through it, and this will be the cause for his coming. As it is written, through its merit, each of you should return to his holding. So hopefully today we are studying together a little bit of the Zohar, so maybe we will hasten the coming of the Messiah. 
Some of the rabbis said that the Zohar is so sacred, so powerful, that actually you can even, there's also power in it, even if you learn it without understanding it. This is a text written in the 17th century in which the uh, uh, rabbi, important rabbi, uh, uh, Nathan, uh, yeah, Nathan Shapira, uh, says. And he, he speaks about reading uh, portions of the Bible, and then he, say, he says, there, oh, there, thereafter, one should read from the Zohar, and not from any other text. And, and even if he does not know or understand what he says, nonetheless, the recitation of the language of the Zohar is greatly beneficial to the Shekhinah, this is the divine presence, and to his soul, more so than any other manner of Torah study. Okay, so even if you don't know Aramaic, understand Aramaic, you can just recite the words of the Zohar, and again, that will be very beneficial to God and to your soul. As the Zohar became more sacred, we're speaking now, we read texts from the 16th century, now from the 17th century, as the Zohar becomes more sacred, so does the image of its alleged author, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was an important uh, rabbi in the, 13th, in the third century, so he was well known. But after the Zohar became sacred and authoritative, he becomes really a very important central saint of Jewish culture. And, and one, one of the expression of, of the sanctity of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai are many songs that were written and sang in his honor. The first of these songs was still very, very popular, was written in the 16th century. Uh, uh, um, you can, that, that, that's the song, we'll hear it uh, uh, soon, by Rabbi Shimon Ibn Lavi. He wrote it in Libya, but very quickly it spread all over the Jewish world. Okay, we don't have time. We'll hear, we'll hear the, the song, hopefully. Uh, uh, I don't have time to explain the words, but actually it's, again, how important, how sacred Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, as the author of the Zohar, how important he is. If you don't dance, at least tap for it. Stopped it because you didn't dance. You... Okay, so so this is one expression. This is this is a very very famous song, but there are many other songs. Soon we'll hear another one on the honor of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai as the author of the Zohar. As Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, beca Bar Yochai and the Zohar become more more uh, famous, people start to uh, uh, make pilgrimage to his gravesite. 
which is in the northern part of Israel, in the Galilee, near the town of Safed in Meron. Uh, it, it, it begins in the 16th century. From the 17th century on, there's a tradition that he died on a, on a specific date, Lag Omer, it's in the Jewish calendar, and people celebrate at the day, they celebrate his death. Actually, it's called the Hilula, which means a wedding day. It's called a wedding because when his soul departs his body, it, it married, it became one with God. This is Mount Meron. This is where he's buried. He's buried here on the, on the, yeah. This is the entrance to the grave. And the celebration, again, the whole night, what people do is sing, dance, and light fires. This is again Mount Meron, of course. It's a, a rabbi of one of the Hasidic courts. Это один из хасидских рэбэ. And his, that, that's a preparations for lighting the fire in honor of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the Zohar. Это приготовление к зажиганию специального огня в честь Раби Шимана Барьёха. И это не все, кто там находится. Это одна только небольшая группа хасидов, а таких групп там множество у подножия всей горы. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that's what they're singing all the time. Это еще один гимн, который вы слышите, посвященный Шимону Бар Йохай. Time, if you visit Israel, try to do it in May, go to see that, it's really something. Okay, so very quickly I would like to give a little bit of a historical survey of the popularization of the Zohar. Uh, um, as I said, in the, uh, and I didn't say it, the Zohar was written in the 13th century, late 13th, early 13th, 14th century in Spain. Until the uh, 16th century, it, it was mostly known amongst Jewish intellectuals, elite intellectuals in Spain. Following the exiles from Spain, so the exile in 1492, Jews were expelled from Spain, and the places where they expelled to, were expelled to, they brought the Zohar there, and it became also important in those places. So that's Italy and North Africa, Palestine, Israel, and uh, Turkey, those are the places first the Zohar becomes more important in the 16th century. 
late, later uh, uh, gradually it becomes also accepted by other uh, uh, Jewish communities. And by the 18th century, the Zohar is accepted as authoritative, sacred, important in all Jewish communities around the world. Until the uh, 17th century, it is mostly intellectual, Jewish intellectuals who read and study the Zohar. But from the late 17th and 18th century, actually it becomes a popular text also by the non-educated. Women also study the Zohar. It becomes really, I will speak later about contemporary uh, 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 popularization of the Zohar. But actually, 18th century was the peak of the popularization of the Zohar in Jewish culture. Now, I don't know if you heard about Shabtai Tzvi, the people that, the person that many Jews in the 17th century believed that he was the Messiah. Instead of redeeming the Jewish people, he converted to Islam after one year after he, he, he was declared as the Messiah. Many Jews continued to believe that he was the Messiah even after that. One of them was Yaakov Frank in the 18th century. Okay. He actually believed that he was a reincarnation of Shabtai Tzvi. He will continue his way. He did not become Muslim. He converted to Catholicism. But Shabtai Tzvi, Yaakov Frank, and their followers believed that there was a Kabbalistic secret for their conversion. Now, these people, and of course, especially their followers and their Jewish followers, contributed very much to the popularization of the Zohar. They believed that the Zohar actually prophesied the history uh, uh, of Shabtai Tzvi. Um, the followers of Jacob Frank even called themselves, they called themselves the Zoharites. Okay, so, so they, th that's not the only reason, but the, the Sabbatianists and the Frankists had an important role in the popularization of the Zohar in the 18th century. Because of that, because some rabbis were uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, the popularization of the Zohar was uh, uh, stimulated by followers of Shabtai Tzvi, they prohibited on the study of the Zohar and of Kabbalah in general before the age of actually 30, not 40. Today, many people say, still say that you're not allowed to study the Zohar uh, 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 if you're younger than 40. This is the source for it. I won't read it, but as, uh, uh, well, I don't know if you can, uh, read it, but, but what they say is indeed this is something that was intended against the Frankist, and they said, don't read Zohar before the age of 30. At the same period, we're speaking, we're now in the 18th century. So on the one hand, this is the peak of the population of the Zohar. Then there's this, the reaction of the rabbis who say, hey, not everyone should study the Zohar. We should restrict it. At the same period, a new movement appears in, uh, in Judaism, in the Judaism, especially first of West Europe, then also the East Europe. This is the Jewish Enlightenment period. This is a, 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 a Jewish movement that wanted to adopt the ideas of the Western Enlightenment and to adopt it and to create a new Jewish identity that will be compatible with the ideas of the Jewish Enlightenment, of the, sorry, of the Western European Enlightenment. In this process, the Jewish, some members, many members of the Jewish Enlightenment believe that what uh, uh, was the obstacle of the Jews to become good Western Europeans was their belief in the Zohar. They were very much opposed to the Hasidic movement, which as we saw already, I think before, the Zohar was very important for them. So just a text of one of the uh, early Hasidim, in the, that's we're already in the 19th century from, uh, from Galicia, from Ukraine, and uh, this is what he has to say about the Zohar. And he's speaking now, he's speaking about the Jews of Galicia, which he means, actually, I think he means the Hasidim, which were the majority of the Jews at the time in Ukraine. One finds an additional grievous evil here. Uh, one finds an addition of grievous evil in them, an old leprosy that clings to their souls and undermines the attempts of the wise to heal their mind and improve their behavior. This book, that is the Zohar, was written by one of the swindlers who wrote books of vanity and wickedness to establish his reputation in Israel or to make a huge profit since he was aware that if people knew he wrote it, his own writing would not gain him recognition. 
Okay, so, so, so like this is a, a Yudamizis, a, a other masculine Jewish, Maskala is the name for the Jewish Enlightenment, they actively fight against the Zohar. They write books in which they prove that the Zohar was a forgery and could not be written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. They ridicule, they make fun of the Zohar, they write parodies of the Zohar. They describe it as a, as a, 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 as a primitive text, and of course the people who believe in it, they describe them as primitives because they believe in the Zohar. As a result of the, the Jewish enlightenment had a great influence on modern Jewish culture. Most Jewish movements that were, that continued the Askala and were influenced by it, rejected the Zohar from their uh, cultural horizon. So that, the, 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 these movements include Jewish conservative movement, Jewish reform, Jewish secular and socialist movement, Jewish national, Zionist movements, all these movements do not have, the Zohar is not part, was not part of their culture. On the other hand, Jews who were not influenced by the Jewish Enlightenment, and that are the Jews of East Europe, the Hasidic, especially the Hasidic Jews, and also the Jews from Arab and Muslim countries. In their culture, the Zohar was still sacred, authoritative, Rabbi Shumen Bar Yochai was important and central. So there was really a very, very strong division in modern Judaism between Jews influenced by enlightenment and not believing and not knowing the Zohar at all, and Jews who were less influenced by the enlightenment in which the Zohar was and still is very much part of the culture. During the 20th century and towards the middle of this 20th century, many of the Jews of uh, East Europe were annihilated in the Holocaust. Jews of Muslim countries immigrated to Israel. The dominant cultures became the secular Jewish culture. And there was an impression, and I, even I think when I started studying the Zohar, that was the impression the Zohar was going to vanish as, as, a, as a living tradition amongst Jews. There were still scholars, the people who were interested in the Zohar and thought it was merit were especially the scholars. This is Gershom Sholem, the founder of the historical study of Kabbalah. But of course, he didn't have a very strong a, a cultural impact apart on some students like myself who started to study the Zohar because he believed that it was very important. I still believe that. So at, until I would say around the, the, the 1980s, it was especially either traditional Jews who still studied the Zohar or the academic scholars who wrote books about the Zohar. But since the 1980s, something changed. Suddenly, more and more people became interested in the Zohar. It's more modern Orthodox groups started uh, uh, teaching and the, the, the Zohar through the internet. Madonna and Britney Spears became interested in the Zohar through the Kabbalah Center and started studying the Zohar. Mich uh, Michael Leitman and the Bnei Baruch group that maybe some of you heard about, also a neo-Kabbalistic group that is very much interested in the Zohar. The new interest in the Zohar sometimes is integrated with new age ideas. This is, for instance, just an example, a text written by the Kabbalah Center where Madonna studied Kabbalah. As you begin your spiritual work with the Zohar, simply scanning the pages allow you to pass over the words and letters. Opens a direct connection to the divine spark hidden within each of us. The more you bring the Zohar into your life, the stronger your connection to the light becomes. So the sound is very modern in New Age, but actually they are repeating very much text that we were read that it's even if you don't understand the Zohar, only thing you need to read it, it still has a power. So again, this is a new revival of these beliefs in the Zohar. In this context of the revival of interest of the Zohar, the Zohar became integrated within a, a contemporary popular culture. Many pop rock groups integrate Kabbalistic and Zoharic themes in their work, in Israel especially. And as we will soon hear in Moscow, it is the jazz that uh, uh, combined, a jazz, jazz band that combines Zoharic elements in their music. But before hearing, the, hearing them, I want us to hear, to listen to an Israeli pop rock group. Uh, they were very, they, they were, they, now they're not together, uh, um, but they were very, very popular. They're called the 
uh, prophetic fools or fools of prophecy, and they compose, this is a, what we'll hear soon, this is a, a passage from the Zohar, a very beautiful passage from the Zohar, um, uh, and they composed it. It became very, it's still very, very popular in Israel. Uh, about five years ago, I don't know if you have in Russia, you have the Kochav uh, Nolad, Star is Born. So, so in one of the contests, the song that won was a singer who sang this, uh, this song that we will hear. So we'll hear about four minutes of the, of the song. Uh, I will conclude with that. I'll just, I'll just that you'll have a sense of the words, so I'll just read the words. The sound of the rolling wheel rolls from below upwards. Hidden chariots go and roll. The sound of melodies rises and falls, wanders in the world. The sound of the shofar stretches through the depth of the divine degrees and orbit and orbits uh, um, and orbits the wheel around. This is the sound of the wheel going up and down. In Hebrew, zehu kol, ze kol galgal, ole veyoret. So let's hear shoteh hanevoa, the prophetic form. Oh 